I kept being guided to tell you specifically is that when you are really looking for an answer or a shift or a sign or something to change and it doesn't seem to be happening, don't, first of all, don't expect it to come a certain way because most likely it's not going to come that way. And when you do expect something to come a certain way, then you actually limit the ability for things to change. So don't expect it. Know that God always does things in a new way. He's always going to deliver things to you in a different way because that's how you grow. That's how he teaches you to grow more. So if he always gave things to you in the way that you always get them, you wouldn't learn anything new. So it's going to come in a different way. It's going to come in a new way. And it's going to come when it's time for it to come. When it takes a little longer than you want it to, you've got to have faith even more. Hello, everyone keep getting the guidance to share this with you and I hope I can deliver this as smoothly and the way that it needs to come out because it kind of references all over the place. I don't know why but there must be someone in this group or several people in this group that need this message and if you don't need this message you probably will need this message and um, so it's worth listening to and maybe saving it. What I want to tell you about is John the Baptist, that he was this, I call him a wild man. And when I said that, I didn't mean it like he's like a wild man, but he kind of (laughs) is. He was just like a wilderness guy. So he's really earthy. And um, his job was to baptize people. That's what he did. And um, he was baptizing people and um, talking about Jesus. You know, he kept saying that there was going to be this person, that the Messiah that comes, and he will be greater than John, and that, you know, he was always preaching about Jesus. Um, so I just want to back up just a little bit. So... Let's talk about how John the Baptist came to be. Uh, There was a couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth couldn't conceive, and they were both very old. And uh, Zechariah was uh, serving as a priest, and he was in the place of worship, and the archangel Gabriel appeared to him and told him that Um, they were going to have a child. And he was like, you know, we're old. How would this happen? Like he, he was saying, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And back then, I mean, I don't know how old they were, but back then people were living like hundreds of years. It's really interesting. I, I mean, they used to live a long time back then. So um, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So I'm just going to read a little bit more of this. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, but he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Okay, so because Zechariah was doubting, he didn't have the faith and he had faith and doubt. And this is what this what I'm talking about overall is about faith and doubt. The angel made it so he couldn't talk because if he could talk, he could taint the ability for Elizabeth to have this baby or 
cause more problems with, you know, his doubts and him talking about it to other people. So he didn't, Archangel Gabriel didn't make him stop talking just to be mean or a punishment. It was to actually help the situation because he had doubt. So John the Baptist is in um, Elizabeth's womb. And then later, I think it's like six months, Mary, uh, I think six months, I'm not sure. Mary gets pregnant with Jesus. And then Mary travels to go see Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth's not real sure about how the baby is because she's not really feeling anything in her womb, although she's, you know, pregnant, but she's unsure about if everything's okay. When Mary comes to the door and Mary's pregnant with Jesus, she comes to the door and Elizabeth opens it and Elizabeth, um, John, he jumps. He definitely moved. And, um... As a result of feeling Jesus in his presence. So he totally like, it was like he rejoiced. Like he just, you know, felt Jesus and responded that to, to him with that. So the story goes forward and John the Baptist is busy baptizing people and, um, you know, being his wild wilderness self. And he had a mind of his own. Like he would just like speak up and say whatever he had to say on his mind, not really um, caring what people thought. I think that was more, um, still more of his kind of wild nature. He was pretty transparent and he would say what he, you know, wanted to say. When he would, he would even like call people names, like um, the Pharisees, for instance. So, um, he condemned the Pharisees, and he called them a, a brood of vipers, which is a family of snakes, because vipers are venom, venomous, and John was essentially calling the religious leaders deadly sons of serpents. It's quite a bold denunciation, and one Jesus repeated to the Pharisees at another time. So he would just like yell out to them and call them names when they would come, you know, and he just didn't care. So I just think that's kind of funny. Um, I, I like his character. The, but the thing was, he, like I said, he was baptizing people, but his message constantly was about that Jesus was coming. These were the words. Um, I'll baptize you with water for repentance. And he always spoke about repentance. That was a big thing to him was repentance and talking about Jesus. Okay, baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with f f fire. And then he goes on to say, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So what he's basically saying is John was baptizing people with water, but he was saying that Jesus is more powerful and he's going to be baptizing people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And using his winnowing fork. So it's like, um, it's, it's like a, you know, he would be separating the good from the bad. And, you know, he would burn up the bad and save the, save the good. And so John was really intense about, oh, hey, you better watch out because he's going to come and he's going to be this badass guy that's going to take numbers and, and clear things up. And that's what he would always say. He had complete faith and trust in what he knew was going to happen, that he was going to meet the Messiah, and that this is what the Messiah would do. And he just knew it without any doubt. Again, we're talking about faith and doubt, okay? So Jesus does show up one day and 
he goes to get baptized and John's saying like, I'm not even worthy enough to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus is like, no, you, I came and you need to baptize me. And so he did. And it went on from there. Now, John claims to be like, John and Jesus were like best friends. Okay. And if you read the Bible, John does reference that many times in his, his, um, book in the Bible. So, um, you know, moving forward, there was a point where Herod, the the king, John was being his kind of belligerent self. Um, I don't know if that's the word, but outspoken self. And he told him that he was wrong for marrying his brother's sister. And he said, that's very bad. And he shouldn't do that. (laughs) And He just spoke his mind, so he ended up in jail for saying that. So he's in jail, and word gets back to him, because he had his own disciples too. Word gets back to him that he hears that, you know, Jesus is out there, yeah, healing people and doing his work and spreading the, the good word and the good news to the poor, like he's out there helping people. And John's just like sitting in jail going, hey, you know, what's going on? Um, I'm here and you're over there. And, you know, what happened to that winnowing fork? Like that you were going to go and and the fire and you were going to go clear out the people that needed to be cleared out and save the ones that are good. Like, where's all that? You're over there healing people and doing your thing, but I'm sitting in jail and you're not weeding out the bad stuff. What's going on here? So he sends a couple of his disciples to go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? You can see like that question. He's saying, hey, so are you the one or is there someone else? Because I'm sitting here in jail and you're over there doing your thing. Like you're not even helping me over here. And so Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So basically, Jesus is saying, you know I'm doing all these miracles, and where are you losing faith that you think I'm not doing something for you? I'm getting chills. And... um, Basically, what he's saying is, first of all, John's upset because he feels like he's not doing what he expected Jesus to do or thought that Jesus would do. So that was his fault because he thought that Jesus and expected Jesus to do things the way he thought. But Jesus is doing it the way Jesus is doing it. So... That That is the first problem. And so then he's uh, John's becoming disappointed because his expectations aren't met, and he doesn't, and it starts to destroy his faith, okay? All this time, John never had anything but complete 100% faith in what Jesus was there to do, and now all of a sudden he is doubting him. So Jesus is like, blessed is he who does not stumble on account of me, meaning there is a greater purpose and a bigger plan. Like you may not be seeing it now, but trust in me, I'm doing all these things. Do you think that there's not a bigger purpose and a plan? So basically that's a, you know a message to us that when we think that we're we're being faithful, we're we're doing our keeping our mind aligned, we're doing our daily practice and we're putting everything into it, but we don't see anything changing and then we start to have that faith and doubt, right? We start going, 
are you real? Are you really going to help me? Like, I'm doing all of this, and I'm not seeing anything change. I'm not seeing anything change. And the thing is, you have to remember that faith is about that part where everything is uncertain. And even though it may seem like nothing's changing, you have to keep that faith. You just have to keep pushing through knowing, like remind yourself, this is what's, this is the message that keeps coming to me to tell you specifically. Zoom out. There's a greater purpose and a bigger plan. Okay, so just because you're not seeing it now doesn't mean you're not going to see it. So, you know, you can find a little bit of solace, I guess, in, in the fact that John, the person that had the most faith in Jesus, came to a point where he started to doubt that. He asked, are you the one? Who is to come, or should we expect someone else? So can you see how you do that in your own life when you're really wanting something to shift or change, and it doesn't seem like it's happening, it doesn't seem like you're getting your answers or the help that you want, and you start to question, you start to doubt? Mark these words. Zoom out. There's a greater purpose. And a bigger plan. So when I say zoom out, you know, when you zoom out, you see a bigger picture. You allow for a bigger thing to happen. You allow for a bigger space to be held to let things fall into place. So when the time is right, when is when something is meant for you, it it does happen. You can't lose the faith. And I also want to remind you, I wasn't going to even bring this up, but remember. A mustard seed size of faith is enough faith, actually, to move mountains. You just have to have faith. So he's sending that message back to John with with John's disciples. So as John's John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Okay, so when John's disciples were asking, Jesus replied to his disciples to tell John that message That's what he wanted John to hear. But when the disciples left, this is what he was telling the crowd that he did not intend for John to hear. He said, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I will tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, and this is in quotes, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So that's a quote, and I believe it's from Isaiah from the Um, And maybe it's repeated throughout the Old Testament, but that's a quote from the Old Testament that was prophesied that John would be sent ahead of Jesus to prepare the way for Jesus. So now Jesus is saying this thing that was prophesied way before he was born. So again, he says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you, meaning That's who you went to the wilderness to see. And then he says, Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. So he's saying, this guy is a prophet. He came before me. He said, you know, he prepared the way for me. So he's like speaking really well of John the Baptist to the crowd. John knew this. He had somehow lost his faith because he wasn't, uh, I guess, patient enough to wait for the way in which he was going to um, be set free. Unfortunately, um, he ended up getting his head cut off (laughs) never did um, make it much further. And that's another story. But 
the message that I keep, I kept being guided to tell you specifically is that when you are really looking for an answer or a shift or a sign or something to change and it doesn't seem to be happening, don't, first of all, don't expect it to come a certain way because most likely it's not going to come that way. And when you do expect something to come a certain way, then you actually limit the ability for things to change. So don't expect it. Know that God always does things in a new way. He's always going to deliver things to you in a different way because that's how you grow. That's how he teaches you to grow more. So if he always gave things to you in the way that you always get them, you wouldn't learn anything new. So it's going to come in a different way. It's going to come in a new way. And it's going to come when it's time for it to come. When it takes a little longer than you want it to, you've got to have faith even more. And remember, even John started to have his doubt. So you can say to yourself, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else like saying that to Jesus or saying that to God? Who else would come? So you have to have faith in God. There's there's nothing better than God. So when you think about this, just get your head around the story and get this into your conscious mind that zoom out, know there's a greater purpose and a bigger plan. And don't question, is God going to do it or not? Because God, if anybody going to do it, is going to be God. Okay? Well, I hope that made sense. There was just so many references I had there, but I needed to get that message to you. So I hope it helped somebody. And if it didn't help you now, you probably will need it within the next two or three weeks when you're in a moment of me needing a little extra faith. Peace and lots of love. Talk to you guys later. Mm-hmm.